Here's Amps for Christ, live on killradio.org.
Augmented to minute.
was a uh, cock of the north. Woo! Oh, yeah! <laughs> An old traditional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's change it up here a little bit. Push it around.
uh, thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, I, I out there in the uh, East Coast and everything, if you're up late enough, there's some of my friends out there who said they might even stay up for this. So, hello out there to win. And maybe some of the Christiansons in uh, Louisville. And, uh, hey, uh, and Nikita Fear Constructor over there in Russia. Wow, oh, yeah, Mr. Matt Hex, Matt Hex in Oklahoma, Fear Constructor in Moscow, what's happening? It hasn't happened yet in Japan, but hi, uh, Emerge Palace, Hame Akita and all you people, uh, yeah, 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 so that's what I love about this, it's all over the world right now, so if anybody's up and listening, uh, that was uh, Amster Christ, live on killradio.org. Thank you uh, for listening. Woo! Oh! All right. Encore. All right. A little bit of straight noise then. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> you asked for it.
Folk Core. You heard it. Right here on killradio.org. Yeah, it wasn't invented by, that term was not invented by Elliot Smith. Oh <laughs> Elliot that Smith. Term Get out of here. It was not invented by Elliot Smith. Give me a Grab break. that microphone right there with the red. Yeah. We got Henry that Barnes the, here. That was the core. <laughs> folk core. And the term folk core is mine, motherfuckers. <laughs> and it's not Elliot Smith. He didn't come up with that shit. <laughs> I was in a hardcore band for freaking seven years playing hardcore with folk roots. I put the two together. It became folk core. It's not a way of living. <laughs> folk core is not uh, hippies and trees. It's fucking hardcore and folk music together. <laughs> okay, right. thank you very much. You heard it right here. So, 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 <laughs> so Henry, Henry. We gotta ask you a few more questions here. Get comfortable. What other questions are there after that? Steve, you got comments. I agree about like life is hardcore. I, I'm not too sure about hippies and trees anymore. Uh, I don't know if they really did cut it. Uh, yeah, my sister's a hippie, and she loves trees and Ivy Field. Oh wow! <laughs> nothing wrong with that. that it's I've just seen the term used for a way of living that's very down to earth very you know yeah back to nature li really oh, yeah. literally in trees and stuff yeah and they co-opted that term but i made it up so oh wow <laughs> so but you made it up years ago right yeah years and years ago was back this, in the early 90s was I, this when you were with your old band yeah let's talk that. about your old band for a minute oh man it's bastard and bastard noise i seen legendary of Legendary. Oh, yeah. We toured a lot and stuff. And uh, we practiced really hard. You know, sometimes I still see Shecky, Eric Wood. I still see him watching me when Hi, I'm Eric. practicing. When I practice, I'll stop a song and start at the beginning like he always did. And, you know, if I imagine that he's there watching, I won't make as many mistakes. I'll actually, I'll actually have my shit together a little bit more if I just imagine, okay, I, you know, that the sergeant is freaking... <laughs> You know, That's the master right. sergeant is right there making sure you don't make any mistakes. Because if you do, it's stop the song. Start all over again. You know, not just muddle through it. None of that, you know. Yeah. So I've been seeing them a lot lately trying to rehearse for these shows. I did, oh, man. And as soon as I think of him in my heart, then I don't make <laughs> as many mistakes. I really don't. So you must have really been thinking about Eric Wood tonight, then, because you played really well, I thought. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was thinking about him while I was rehearsing. For this <laughs> that's for sure. Didn't know that about and it. I didn't hear you stop and restart anything. So, so that, yeah, it was a great. It was a, it was a really great band, and uh, it introduced me to the world of hardcore, which I didn't really know before. I was in a quote unquote uh -huh. late punk band called the Dull. Okay, but yeah, and this it was is really kind of just hard, grungy rock. Mm -hmm. It wasn't core. It wasn't hardcore. You know, they you called it playing. punk at the time. It was just heavy. Dude, what about White Throne? Why I was never in White Throne. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were. That was Mars. Wait a minute. Whose voice are we hearing? Can we introduce this fellow? That we got some guests in the studio here. Co-conspirator from <laughs> Man is the Bastard <laughs> and Bastard Noise, Bill Nelson. Step in up the to house. the microphone, Bill. Step up. <laughs> uh, He's hand being a shy right now. Uh, <laughs> we, got co we got lots of microphone cables That was here. probably the most rambunctious period of uh, Man is the Bastard is when we had two noise artists with Eric Wood on bass, Connell on drums, and Aaron, and Aaron Kenyon on, on the second bass. Because and two noise artists. Because you have to match bass plus noise. Yeah. You have to balance it out. If there's a one bass, then you have to have one noise, and then another bass playing. Two bass. basses, two noise, noise artists. Two noise. That's right. Two bass, two noise. Yeah, <laughs> That's we, a good balance. It we was, needed another noise for the drums, though. Yeah. No, I he mean, made a lot of noise himself. I used to, I used to, I had one oscillator that it was extremely microphonic, and it would start doing riffs if you vibrated it. So I put it near the drums, and it would actually go off, <laughs> act like a trigger for the drums. Did that at the whiskey, and we didn't pay to play at the whiskey. Thank you very much. <laughs> we were invited to play there, you know. So uh, we didn't pay to play at the whiskey. I know we played at the whiskey at Madison Bastard. That was one of my favorite shows. And it was a wooden stage, and I put that 
real sensitive oscillator by the drums, and it was picking up everything the drummer did. I mean, it was keeping time, but with full oscillations and full hardcore noise, but with the drums exactly. It's like I planned it that well, way. Well, hopefully everybody out there understands what you're talking about, about oscillators and stuff. I heard, so I saw you playing an oscillator, at least one. I think there might be four or five. Can you there talk several about oscillators gear? there? There's some gearheads listening. I know this. So. They're uh, all tube oscillators. Uh-huh. And they're basically like synthesizer boxes because they uh, make sound on their own. Anything that synthesizes sound is a synthesizer. So even if you don't plug anything into it, you can get this thing them to go and so make do noise. They, do they make sawtooths or they sine waves? I was going for sawtooth when I was designing this one. That's what I wanted was a sawtooth. I don't think I heard sawtooth. I think I heard... <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't have I a name. I departed from the sawtooth thing a long time ago. It took me months. <laughs> I was looking at it on a scope, looking for the sawtooth wave for months, trying to get this. You know, I had some old 50s design that didn't have any of the values. It just had the concept. So I was trying to copy the concept and make a sawtooth wave, which is that you have a satellite oscillator. Here's how you make a sawtooth. You have one oscillator that's going or whatever, and then you the signal splits off into another oscillator that pulses and so every time that the wave comes down it chops off the end of the wave and creates the wow. tooth oh, so wow. to create the tooth it takes two oscillators wow. one actual oscillator and then a satellite oscillator could to chop up the wave and make it into a saw Henry, shape. could you illustrate an example right now is your stuff still plugged in ah uh, could you do a, a play you know, as a sawtooth I, for a second, or is that hard to tell? I think that stuff's a little beyond wow. anything you can draw. At this point, it's uh -huh. not like Unless, yeah, it was. Well, fuzzy. see those drawings up there. Yeah, see those. That's <laughs> what that shit. I had like a pretty good sawtooth <laughs> on by the by the no end joke. of a uh, by the end of a few months. I had a pretty good sawtooth waveform on the scope. So it literally created by this, and then I took my grunge boring, pedal. And, and the grunge pedal could do a sawtooth just fine. There and I was go. like, oh, man, what's no big deal there, man, you know? <laughs> but what I read in this old 50s book is that, that they used it for, uh, like, violin sounds and musical sounds is what the early synthesizers used the sawtooth mm. because it's a musical waveform. Right. It's a musical sounding waveform. Very pure. Very pure. But Very with some With some harmonic on it, you know, like a sine wave sounds like a flute. Mm -hmm. And it's very, there's not... It's very pure, and but there's not much going on. And a sawtooth sounds like a violin uh -huh. or a clarinet or something because it has a, has more uh, grit to it. Okay. That's what a sawtooth actually adds the, the, more the edge. Talk it, more directly into the mic. Oh, it, it does. Uh, yeah. It adds the edge to it, the sawtooth does. So, so it's much more edgy than a uh, sine wave. And then a square wave sounds like crap, in my opinion. Unless it sounds like a sine wave turned up something. really low. Yeah. Yeah. Square waves are, are the ones that sound nasty. Mm. You know, the nasty sounding wave is square. But to make a sawtooth, you actually start with a square wave. That's what you feed this thing with. You feed it with a square wave. It chops off the end of the wave and makes it into a sawtooth. And uh, I was experimenting tonight with my old Eco oscillator made in Michigan somewhere uh, near Heathkit, you know, it's the same type of company. Is made that Benton in Harbor there? What is that? Yeah. Benton Harbor Metal. It's Benton Harbor Metal all the way, man. And it has a switch for uh, square wave or uh, sine wave. So so you're, you're literally using very old, made in USA, like hardcore, well-built Yeah, this is an stuff. audio oscillator called an, e uh, an Eco. And I was actually, I use it to drive another oscillator drones but yes. I can shape the wave once I once the wave mm -hmm. sign or square coming off the original uh, probably early 60s or mid 60s it looked like about a mid 60s like eco. silver apples used to rock those man um, oh yeah yeah a and lot then of freaks. yeah yeah and uh, you know great and band. the band oscillator Ben Walcott from the band oscillator who you know that's the best name for a, a a noise band almost I ever. know him well. He's a great guy. Oscillator, man. That is the best. Major talent. Yeah. And, yeah, it's over the top what he does. Yeah. He, he takes these things and puts switches in them. Yeah. And he hot rods them so that they oh, yeah? start, yeah, they start doing full orchestras. And I mean, he can he can play all kinds of wow. really, really in tune. Uh-huh. He, he, he mapped it all out with half steps and whole steps and, like, being able to really go off with it. Yeah. With, wow. And he has one just like this that's all hot rodded. And uh, so oh, yeah. someday I'm going to get him to show me how he did that. <laughs> I know how he did that. I, I, he, he, I kind of guessed, and he kind of nodded that I was sort of right. <laughs> and that is there's an A, B, C, D switch that's the range 
switch and it's all right. resistors. Yeah, that's right. So it jumps it up. They're wean. Whole They're octaves. Wean wine. Wean oscillators. Yeah. But it's just all resistors on this big old switch. So oh if you God. just pick the right resistors and they're close enough uh, of a tolerance, then you can mm. you could make a, a pad with just resistors and switches. Right. To do a full scale. Just like the handheld. Yeah, like the That's handheld. That's all it is, yeah. Yeah, and, but it divides between like probably thing, 20 octaves. Well, the something. trick is, is is those things, you, you, you move the, the resistors and the capacitors at the same time. It's an RC. It's a yeah. combo. So each step, it has both. They're like double. Oh, yeah. They're yeah. double rotaries. Kind those of caps. Those I, caps, I, they get you. They probably got a few coils in there, too. I feel like we're at a meeting between the engineers at NASA or something. There's this. Uh, <laughs> Take off. <laughs> Inductors, inductors. <laughs> Coils are called inductors. When just you a, use them just a choke, baby. Steve, choke. Steve, Steve has choke. a question. Steve, yeah. Steve has a question. Yeah. Would you be able to maybe come back and do a version of Free Bird? Or? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, right, man. Steve. I'll play it all night long, brother. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. I played Free Bird in a band, believe it or not. Yeah, you I, know, yeah, I don't want to drag Don't even <laughs> take me there, man. Long time ago. All the chicks used to ask for that song yeah, when yeah, I was yeah. in a cover band for a little while. And we did that. Well, you mentioned it. I think the guitarist of uh, Leonard Skidder doesn't even want to play that one anymore. But still. oh, he probably doesn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, baby. You down the ramp, baby. I love you so much, but you're down the ramp. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. it's a down the ramp song, and it's all you know, so so romantic. But he's dumping the shit out of this chick. You know, he's like later. <laughs> in a real nice way. That's the way Freebird is so uh, touching, you know. It's because it's why the ladies want to hear it. The only one worse than that is Dylan, you know. Go softly off the edge, babe. Go lightly on the ground when he's dumping. <laughs> <laughs> you like that one, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> he's talking about one of your heroes. Oh, that's what Dylan uh, said. Uh, oh yeah, man, you know, it, just, uh, it ain't me, babe. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go lightly on the ground. Oh my God. So yeah, Freebird's another uh, dumping song. I know. So who, who are those. some of your heroes, Henry? Ah uh, well, uh, Pierre Henry, Thomas from the 30s Edison. noise uh, pioneer. That uh, oh. Eric Wood gave me some CDs early on when we were getting into noise. Or early stuff like uh, Nurse with Wound, oh, wow. White House, that kind of stuff is what I heard yeah. at first. Yeah, and I d hadn't really been introduced to that that much you know at that point but i really like that kind of stuff and of course you know as far as music is concerned i'm just die hard hendrix you know freak you know, there never you never there i don't think he, anybody's actually topped him as far as a lot of things you know first time i right. saw you play you know what you were doing right what you were picking with your teeth Oh man! Yeah, I did. I used no to joke. do a couple of really bad Hendrix. I mean, no, I did no, my own good. way. No, no, I, I didn't mean no. it was bad. It was good. Well, it thank blew you. My mind. You. Oh yeah, I used to try to do Hendrix type stuff. You know, yeah, from you time to time. Well, you know, good. Hendrix started out emulating his idols and stealing all those tricks and doing all that stuff. Oh, he's so. And then he but developed he's, his own voice. He's the acrobat. You know. Yeah. But he tried to play a sitar once and didn't like it. Oh wow! You know, Hendrix was like. Oh, man, don't got time for that, you know. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but Henry. Elmore James never played a sitar, so yeah, why yeah. would he? He didn't need no sitar. <laughs> what were you going to say, no. Steve? What I was going to say is, like, what you're doing now, had to start, like, it had to have a source. I think Jimmy was it. Yeah, he was probably my one of my biggest sources. Yeah. See, the other biggest source that I, you know, as far as other than, like, hardcore and noise and stuff like that is no. actually real traditional, good no. British Isles wow. music. From like a hundred years ago, God. the stuff that was emulated by the set in the seventies by Dave Danon and uh, people like that, who all cheesed out kind of later mm -hmm. later on. But Steel yeah. Ice Band and, and that ilk, and you know the Incredible String Band, and uh, yeah. uh, bands Those guys were great from that era. You know, I really I really love that kind of stuff too. The Chieftains, man, I love the Chieftains. You like Thompson? Chieftains Five is the best album. Oh, wow, are you a Thompson yeah. nut? The Blessed Richard Thompson. Yeah. As uh, yeah, you know, as June Tabor called him, I went and saw June Tabor live, and she kept on referring to him as the Blessed Richard Thompson. <laughs> and I actually never gave him a chance because I only heard one or two things, and I didn't like it. So it's I was like, real whatever. hit or miss. Yeah, I was like, I didn't hear the right thing because all my friends who like all the same stuff I do love the guy. Well, it's and I heard two songs, and I was like, mm, tasteful playing, okay. you know? Yeah, yeah, like Bert Janch and all those thing. guys. Yeah, yeah. 
I it never it ne- it didn't grab my nuts. It didn't didn't grab me. Didn't go. What, what, do you, <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you what do you have to say, Steve? You like I would much you much, much rather hear the day to non or like some really old stuff, you know. But I you know I'm not dissing on Richard <laughs> Thompson. I, I I'm sure he's really really good, and I like all the ways his guitars looks. I mostly just see pictures of him, you know, in magazines and stuff. He's kind of an ugly mug. Nah. He looks like Clapton. He looks like Eric Clapton or something. And I'm sure he's actually really, really, really good, and I just never gave him a chance, you know. Well, so what, what I'm going to I'm gonna Steve, think about that. Steve had a question. Yeah, I had a, I, but then again, I'm getting so much information from you. I almost hate to interrupt, but fill me on a noise. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I mean, is what's behind noise? Is, is there a philosophy? Is I, I notice like, there's a lot of rage in it. I mean... Well, it, noise can be anything, really. Uh, it, it has. I like noise. Everyone has their own taste. I see. Yeah. But it's <clears throat> wide open, and I personally like noise that has a random element. Ah. You know, like uh, I got introduced to noise by myself because I was making these preamps for guitars to overdrive them, all tube, with like. Each one had like several mm-hmm. stages, and they would go nuts, and they had their own tone control circuits, oh. gains like five gains, and I was always trying to get cool. them not to oscillate. You know, <laughs> that was the thing: is you didn't want it to oscillate; you wanted it just to, you know, make the guitar uh-huh. sustain forever and sound radical, right? You know, but if it started going off on its own, that's what you didn't want. So I would go, but one night, real late, I was up, I was in this industrial park screwing around with an oscillator and I plugged a cassette player into it and it was actually a Chieftain's bagpipe part wow. going into this oscillator wow. and it took that thing and ripped it up so cool and then it was in, and it was random it started just going you know with the bagpipe part doing all this random stuff and arpeggios off of it and just going crazy and it shocked me it was so good and it was so different and, and bitching I just stopped right there and I went Oh, yeah, I'm putting a switch on that. You know, I started putting yeah. switches every time I'd find it. You know, instead of trying to get rid of oscillations, I'd just put a switch that I could get there again or try to get there again. But that's the whole thing. That's you, how I you just said wow. it. Like the bagpipes and the, any kind of reed flute, it's a natural kind of distorted sound that you yeah. hear in almost every culture in the world. Yeah. You hear it in the Middle East, you hear it in India, and, and you hear it in. Um, in and then the, you the drive British that through, yeah. through an oscillator as a trigger. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like the guy's got a thousand fingers, yeah. You know, oh just thousand fingers going at once. Yeah, you, you, all you, you know, all by yourself. Just all whoa, a thousand fingers, man. Okay, yeah, says Steve. one thing, and then you know, from there, then uh, that was about two months before I joined Man of the Bastard, and I introduced, I, I showed Eric Wood what I was doing with these preamps, because I actually got kicked out of the band for sounding like. Uh, too much haywire. <laughs> too haywire, you know. Right before that, you know, I was like, they were like, oh yeah, well, okay, well, we'll we'll what we'll call bit? we'll call you, you know, we'll call you. Atavism of Twilight was all. Uh, oh really? Yeah, I tried out and I was making all this noise and I had all these homemade amps and everything and they're like, I didn't oh, know you play with the atavisms. It was too. It was too clean. They were, we were too like atavisms of like. They're doing do all this clean stuff. So the band said to me, they said, oh yeah, well we love jamming with you and but uh, you know we'll call you. Don't worry about calling us. <laughs> and that was a couple. Of <laughs> and then, but I showed that stuff to Eric Wood, and he loved it right yeah. off the bat. He just and he started introducing me to all the real noise artists. He said, "Well, man, you got to hear this. You got to hear, you know, that kind of stuff." So he really introduced. You know, he was wide open to it. And he right from the start, he wanted what, to add what, that to what, the repertoire. What about the other elements of that band, like the political kind of, you know, political thing is hard to live up to. I mean, we were working together at this bakery, and we'd stay. We'd be up at like two thirty in the morning, and I was showing him how to make all this uh, pastry, and we'd talk about the state of the world and all, uh, you know, like stuff like the giant island of plastic out in the Pacific, and yep. just how much, how much hateful stuff man does to the earth, and like. Oh, I remember looking at this National Geographic, and they had these, you know, like all our used tires. You wonder what happened to that man. They got these mountains in Chile that are literally the size of mountains of just old tires. Oh, wow. It's just ridiculous looking. And there was these pictures. It was like, you know, like 10 square miles piled, thousands of feet tall 
of all of America's old tires. So America's Americans consumerism, you know, uh, corporate yeah. greed, yep. all those kinds of things. That's man is the bastard, and it was mostly about man's uh, interaction with nature and, and screwing nature over with mercury and all the stuff we do for ease and yeah, and and half of it's so you can have disposable stuff, so you can right. throw it away, you know. And so uh, we uh, tried to scream and get hateful about it and really bring it to light, and you know, uh, about the politics of corporate greed and waste and inhumanity to nature and those things. But then, you know, what happens after about seven years, this is what happened to that band with all of us, is it backfires on you because you still drive a car, you know, mm -hmm. you still need tires, you still use bags, you still have to use all this corporate stuff. What if I want a screw for one of my oscillators? Oh, I want a I want a uh, 832 screw. What am I going to do? Go down to Lowe's, buy me a screw. There's got to be a, some corporation making that shit. Or it's not going to be available for you to get. So in a way, we're interdependent on these corporations mm -hmm. for stuff like that. If you want to, you know, and for everything. I just, if I had my way, if I was the president of the United States, I'd outlaw here, here. disposable lighters. I'd try to get rid of planned obsolescence in every possible way. So there would be a lot less dispos disposable shit and like people going, well, I'm an entrepreneur because I figured out how you can fuck the earth more by making something you can just flush down the toilet <laughs> when you didn't have to before. You could use it again. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I'm an entrepreneur because I figured out how to get somebody to buy something they didn't need One and will destroy the earth ADs. more. Right. Those kind of people make me mad. And this whole kind of uh, the entrepreneurial spirit where you're screwing the earth, you know, with your entrepreneurialism. This is, this is a way we can make this thing wreak havoc on the earth. It's like disposable lighters or anything like that. That's just like a major example that happened early on. You know, that kind of could have been the time. That could have been the timeline when we could have saved it, right, when they made the disposable lighters. Or if Carter had gotten elected again, I'm telling you, we'd have alternative energy now mm -hmm. these people talk about carter being the best ex-president ever did you know those are republican words they planted that shit so you hear progressive people go oh well yes carter was the best ex-president ever ha 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 they're full of baloney that those words come straight out of republican mouths they plant that stuff in the thing is he was a great president he wanted to get off the fossil fuels then the whole thing about Reagan climbing on the White House and taking imagine, the solar panels off is real. Now, man. Yeah. We would be in a lot better shape if we hadn't got... Oh, you think we would have uh, beat the Soviets? You think the, uh, do you think the Cold War would have ended? I do. Yeah, I do. Reagan went and arm-wrestled Gorbachev in person, right? Yeah, he right. Was so badass. Yeah. No, it, that, that, that was all coming down anyway. You know, he took credit for something that was already happening. You know? He said, uh, what was the Reagan quote? They're, it's like they're sitting on a sharp pin because he was, you know, well, look, we've got Star Wars. It was just, the Star Wars thing was just to, like, scare him or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to pump all the economy of the world into the military, you know. Hey, you think those, you think that uh, when they're flying right now, right, what they're flying up there, because we don't have a... We don't have a space shot right now, right? Yeah, the Russians are flying us to space think, now. I just want to ask you one thing. Do you think they got vacuum tubes in there, man? I do. I do, too. They do. <laughs> the Russians are making vacuum tubes still, and uh, there's, there's certain Sorry. things where there's certain areas where vacuum tubes are still better because they don't uh, break. Like those MIG fighters? With certain and rays and stuff. Yeah, because if you, hit, if you hit it certain, just about any transistor, no matter how you shield it and everything. Yeah, they, they can take the hit from the, from the nuke, too, right? Yeah, they can take the nuclear a nuclear. Oh, because it fries. Uh, it'll bake the it'll bake the flakes. It'll bake the flakes, mm -hmm. but a vacuum tube will survive. Yeah, and that's why they had them in the MIGs, you know. Mm -hmm. So they that, could fly through mushroom clouds. Yeah, <laughs> wait, wait, like to to Wagner. Yeah, yeah. Shostakovich. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> la la la. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, I, we got a couple other guests in here, and I just wanted to see give them an opportunity to speak. Um, we got our friend Omar here. Do you want to? Do you have any questions or anything? Well, I happen to know this fellow from way back. Um, I last spoke to this fellow ten years ago, and all of a sudden he just reappeared. <laughs> um, <laughs> from Clare Claremont. From Claremont, believe it or not. Um, well, ho hopefully I'll give you a, a, a good answer. Uh, 
I meant to say question, by the way. Um, what was um, your first influence as far as guitar playing music? Or as far as playing guitar you, um, before before you got into um, uh, folk court? Uh, well, you know, I had a band when I was in third grade. So I started pretty young. I took lessons from this lady. I had a real bad experience playing piano, and I still can't look at written music. Mm. Written notes give me, like, I have a, a bad reaction to it still. And um, because of this piano teacher that was, like, pretty mean, and it just wasn't fun. And my parents were getting divorced and fighting during the time, and, you know, my dad and mom would, be, you know, my mom would try to show me something on the piano, and my dad would yell at me if I practiced it or not, and they were getting divorced. So I got caught in the middle of that during the piano lessons. And so what are they, an aversion to like even like seeing written music makes me feel funny still to this day. Mm -hmm. But then right after that, I got this lady uh, guitar teacher, and I took some lessons and learned the basic chords like on top of Old Smokey and stuff, and I was in third grade. Right. And there was a couple other kids that played guitar, and we got together, and we did Drunken Sailor and songs like that. And <laughs> we had three guitar players, and, uh, you know, that was my first band, you know. And from there, I just kind of – I took a lessons with her for probably for about six months, and then when I was in third grade, and then after that, I just tried to – I just kept playing it. And I, I put it down for a couple months – I mean, a couple of years. And then when I was, like, 12 or something, I started playing again more. You know, people go through these times where they – Nice. Start really young in this top, and uh, got in a band doing Queen's Clearwater covers, pretty much, with just cool. being a drummer. And that was fun. Yeah, <laughs> stuff like and that. Which and one last question: Which uh, guitar you prefer, a Fender Stratocaster or a Gibson? Any Gibson? I mean, a, a flying well, B. Well, you asked the right person. Because uh, <laughs> I'm a Stratocaster man. All the way. I could tell. I could. Um, I tell right off. Les definitely. Pauls are. I just don't like them. Never have. I played a couple. I mean, I work on them all the time. I, I have seen some really nice Les Pauls that have great tone and stuff. But I don't like Les Pauls. I don't like the length of the string. Too thick. Um, I don't like the angle of the neck against the body. There's a lot of things I don't like about them. I'd rather play an SG. I like them better. Than Les Pauls. It's not the weight. I just, I had a '68 Les Paul Custom, and I thought it was a tank. It was a boat anchor. I think I traded it for a '72 P bass. You know, so I'm a I'm a Strat guy all the way. I mean, I had a Strat one time that was like a Stradivari. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sounds nice. Yeah. You know. <laughs> A 63 Sunburst, just like uh, John Frusciante has. You know, one like that. Mm. It was like the red the red violin type Stratocaster. <laughs> you know what I mean? The Real violin. mad to the ghosts in the tone. With the, it, the blood of his dead wife. There's ghosts in it, wife. man. It was, it Those things have <laughs> ghosts in them. Something Fender did at that factory at certain periods, you get one of the jewels from that, and it's got ghosts, real mm. ghosts. They, they, that's why they cost so much money. There's, there's actual ghosts in it. Probably Mexican ladies or something that were working at his factory. I don't know. Mm. There's voodoo. There's voodoo involved. Mm. Yeah. You know, although you know, like a sixty, a 1960 Les Paul is probably worth the most. Or 59. There's two years. You know that are each one's worth as much as a house. Jeez. Because of the materials. You know. Yeah. It they makes have sense. these really, really, really super, super fine uh, flame maple. You know, the, the tiger maple on the top of those. Yeah. That those particular years. That's why those that particular years were so much. Anyway, I'm a strat guy, all the way. I at least <laughs> want to just like say hi to Dustin who showed up tonight. Dustin from Actuary and about hi Jeremy. Twelve other bands. You were in here last <laughs> time, with your with your band Pretty Agony. With the Pop Project, yeah. That was really that was we really were partying. Great. Christy, that was a lot of fun. You and Christy, yeah, that was that was amazing. Hopefully you guys will come back. Again. When are you guys playing again? I don't. I don't uh, when, when are we playing again? Isn't it in April? I think it you is guys in have April. A show on the twenty first. Yeah, on the twenty first is our uh, record release party. We got the fourteenth. The fourteenth. Oh yeah, we're playing. Well, that's actuary. Oh, you're. Oh other no, band. but pretty yeah. agony's playing out there too. Yeah, pretty agony. Oh, you mean over actuary? <coughs> Wonder Valley. Yeah. Oh. Astro Hisagawa is going to be in town. He's going to be uh, putting it down, dude. It's going to be. It's going to be something special. Flying in for that? Oh hell yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> and then. Uh, 
Actuary has a, a, a pretty badass show with uh, Mr. Barnes here later on in April, too, uh, the 28th at the Handbag Factory. It's with Bastard Noise. It's going to be something special. Oh. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. But it, it was good listening to you tonight, Henry. It was Thank you. Excellent. Justin. And I'm right there hey, with last you. Last time we played at the uh, handbag factory, remember that wall? That was fucking wall. something special. We probably won't see that again, but there will be something I similar hope, at oh, the next show. Really. It was an incredible uh, PA system. We so had you just had a time. wall of, of I, I heard some, and ants. I heard rumor of like yeah. 10, 15s are going to be at the next one. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure on the specifics. Plugs, yeah. Yeah. It, it's, I mean, it's going to be sick. It was incredible because you hear really good PAs, but this one, the last time we played there, Actuary and Ask for Christ and Bastard Noise at the Handbag Factory, there was a uh, PA that was the full wa- length of the it was, wall. It was Jeff's PA from and, Actuary. Um, it went down into the low, low, low 20 hertz without distorting. So it really, really felt good down there. Oh, you know? yeah. I mean, it was amazing. <laughs> it, was like, it was like one of those happy ending massages. Oh, that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's, Not yeah. that I know anything about that, but... Some that's, of the most incredible live sound. That's, I've ever, isn't I've that ever. his like, Desert Rave PA or something? Uh, yeah, so yeah he does house shows yeah. with that. Yeah. yeah. Remember those old servo stuff. speakers, the servo drivers? Mm. Oh. Servos, huh? Yeah, they used to make these speakers that had a, a motor on the cone. A dr- driver for the low stuff, yeah. Jeez. Those things like felt like you were getting hit in the head with a bat, though. <laughs> oh, Steve, boy. You had another question, I think, Steve. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I have memories about getting hit in the head with a bat, but I'll save it for another program. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> are you kidding? <laughs> let, me, let me have it. <laughs> no, actually, I wanted to go back to the set uh, that you started out with. That was that was really very fitting, uh, actually, for the whole theme of Women's International Women's Day because I actually got images of a Middle Eastern woman. Oh, cool! And while you were doing doing your set and everything. Well, thank you. Yeah, me me too. I, I thought about it today, you know, preparing for the show. I was like, wow, it's uh-huh. International Women's Day. I gotta, you know, I'm not gonna be. Uh, I'm gonna be thinking about that. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, I was thinking about it because you know we wouldn't be here. I, I really liked what you were saying. Oh, thanks. Yeah, thanks. So, how did you? What were your influences on that? Or on the first song, the Eastern stuff. Yeah, I mean, what got you involved with Middle Eastern? I... Middle Eastern music and me go way back to because uh, after I got out of high school, I somehow got this record that was produced by Jer- uh, George Harrison, and it was called a Folk Festival from India. And it had about a hundred players stand, you know, on the back. There was a picture of them, and they were doing all these traditional folk songs of India on this vinyl. Oh wow! And I just listened to that thing over and over again. I loved it. It just, it really. That's so. That's how I got that. Folk songs of India. Oh wow! Gotta look for that one. Tradition. No, it was. Uh, it was called a folk festival from India. Oh yeah, I know which ones you're talking about. There's a bunch of them. Like every year they had them, 68, 69. Yeah, this was a real early one. I've never been able to find this exact vinyl. It had one on the back and then it had like every Indian instrument with a picture of it and the name. Yeah, not this one. This one was before that. It just had a picture of them on the back. Okay. And it had like a mantra on the front. Oh. Like artwork and then the back had a picture of them all standing like tall, you know, short in front, tall in back, like four or five rows back of all the players. Wow. That was what was on the back of this one. Oh, With a picture of George Harrison and Ravi Shankar in the front of the people on the little stand. That was the picture. And I think it was on Dark Horse. I don't know if it was, but it's never I've never seen it be re released. It's I guess I saw I think I saw the one you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And it's I think it's the same people. I think it's their second one. Yeah, it's like Ravi Some, Shankar's Festival from uh, India yeah, Volume. Folk Festival from yeah. India. With Ravi Shankar, yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. That's some really, really great stuff. If you're and uh, to learn about Indian music, it kind of took me back to within, when now within and without you. Oh yeah, uh, that, yeah, that, that really that took period. me that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are certain notes that they do uh, that are really subtle. That I mean, I think you have to spend a whole lifetime really to get good at Indian music. It takes a lifetime. Oh wow. So I do. I I just basically improvise a lot I mean I'm good at that and they are too but they improvise with such a structure rhythmically it is in totally it's extremely intense with uh, you have to actually study study spoken rhythm you know the do dot 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 all the talking the talking the drum part for seven years 
to play sitar. You spend seven years doing the rhythms first. Oh, wow. Spoken. Mm-hmm. Then you start on the strings. You got to crawl before you learn to walk. You got to right? crawl before you <laughs> learn to walk. And that's how intense it is. It's such highly evolved music. It's like Krishna or something, you know. It's yeah. really super highly evolved. So if I can just some somehow just maybe even touch a little bit of one lick that actually sounds real, I'm pretty happy about that because, yeah, around like a, let's say a C note, you know, they have five or six different ones all real close to it too. So the ear training is intense and the rhythm training, t- it's the most uh, intellectually evolved and sophisticated music there is, I think. Oh, wow. Yeah, and so as a Westerner, I just... If I I I it'd take a uh, you know my whole life to if I and really I'd have to really get into it to to get to the point where I was even uh, considered myself. I, th- I think you can take Robbie. I think you can take him. Oh, he can take at his daughter still. <laughs> at at <laughs> ninety one, dude, he's still playing. I saw Robbie play with Anushka. He's playing this week. Yeah, Long he's Beach. playing in Long Beach. Yeah. Oh, when I saw him at the Disney Hall, it was amazing because you know Anushka is kicking royal butt. Here's Anushka, you know, doing it really great licks. And then Ravi would play the same ones. And it was like watching linen and then silk. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> you know? First there was Anushka with it, and it was fine linen. And then Ravi did the same lick, and it was the purest silk. Oh, my God. Anyway. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well, that's, I don't know, maybe we should wrap up the conversation at this point, but really appreciate you being here, Henry. Thanks, Jerry. And, uh, yeah, thank you very thanks, much. Thanks to everyone thank you. Listening. Sure, it's a pleasure. Great doing the show with you, man. Sure. Thanks to everyone listening all around the world. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. everyone have a good night. Yeah.